Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Collider Mailbag. It's Sunday, and I'm back. So is Mark Riley. Hi. <laughs> and so is Sinead Dufresne. She will be moderating us, gentlemen, here today. How are you, Sinead? I'm doing well, thanks. I think I've finally forgiven Riley, so we're I, all right. I, I'm glad that we had this talk earlier. And, um, you know, if I could change a lot in my life, the one thing I would change would be marrying Sinead Dufresne. That's right. Wait, you would change yourself to marrying her as opposed to offing her, which you did on the Schmoes No Live show. Which Thursday was, uh, I was put on a, it was a moment that I'm not proud of. I was put on the spot and uh, just garbage came out of my mouth. Yeah. Well, it's right, Sinead? A a put on the spot and garbage coming out of somebody's mouth. We're not going to tell you who won the matchup. We're just going to let you guys know that right now on Collider Video's channel, right here, you can find the match between Mark Riley and Elliot Dewberry kicking off the ultimate Schmodown. You were the ones seed elliot was the eighth seed yeah wait until you guys see the carnage that ensued in the meantime let's take some questions here is how it works on mailbag is that we shake off the hangover from last night and we try to answer some of your best questions of the week shanae is going to read them i'm going to answer them riley's going to answer them then we're going to turn that spotlight right back on shanae and she'll have to answer questions maybe that was a great <laughs> breakdown thank you all right okay Tom writes, hi, Glider crew. I just recently rewatched Dread since you guys have talked about it so much and remember just how awesome those drugged out slow-mo scenes are. Coupled with that badass slow motion scene in the Wonder Woman trailer, it got me thinking about some of the best uses of slow motion. What do you think are some of the best scenes, not including the Matrix? What are some of your favorite scenes, not including the Matrix? And when are these scenes the most effective, not including the Matrix? Thanks, shit rat pack. I'm going with the Matrix, Riley. <laughs> 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 That's it, huh? Just the Matrix, huh? No, there's actually, like, it's a great question. There's so many <laughs> uses of slow motion in film, you know? And, mm -hmm. and yes, the Matrix did pioneer for it a different type of slow motion as far as fighting style that you would see, and it's probably something that John Woo watches and just gets all excited in his man parts. But that <laughs> even before those movies, like, like, there was a lot of slow motion uses in even classic films yeah. that people don't bring up enough, one of which is the, 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 the climactic scene in Bonnie and Clyde with Warren and Beatty and Faye Dunaway when they're just great getting one. blown away in slow motion. It's so well done. Yeah. That's something that really speaks to me. Now, look, uh, there's a scene in The Untouchables oh. mm -hmm. that is great, but it's actually based on Battleship Potemkin, and it was kind of like an homage to that. That's why Brian De Palma put that in the movie. And then from The Untouchables scene, that was spoofed in The Naked Gun. I think it was 33 and a third. Or yeah, was it, I think it was 33 and a third. It was 33 and a third. Which is the weakest of the Naked Gun movies, and it's not that good. But that scene in the Naked Gun movies is fine if you can look past the fact that there's a guy who murdered two people starring in those movies. Yeah. And then we go to Inception. Uh, I think Michael Bay has a lot of good ones. It, when Michael Bay is good, mm -hmm. he utilizes slow motion well. There's some good scenes in The Rock. There's some great ones in 13 Hours that it never gets over the top Michael Bay, like the Transformers and turns into a bad music video. He, when he keeps himself in check he's great and i brought up john woo earlier because he directed one of my favorite films of my youth hard target no. some great slow motion spin kicks in that flick what do you got for us riley those are some great ones uh there's a very iconic one that is um uh d kind of recreated a, a lot they did it in swingers but reservoir dogs when they yeah. are coming out of the restaurant to go take on the heist there's that iconic shot now that so many people with that music going that that was that became a signature of uh, that movie for Quentin Tarantino, and a lot of people tried to do it, which was great again in Swingers, which mm -hmm. I just watched the other night, and they were talking about uh, filmmaking and how Quentin Tarantino did it. No, nah, it's overused, and all the guys sitting there want to be actors, directors, producers, like ah, oh, it's so overdone. You know, I can't believe they did that, and then they walk out to that same right. shot, which I thought was a great little nod. So I love that. Then there's a little known one that I adore from the Darjeeling Limited by Wes Anderson, wow, okay. they're running to catch the train, and they're, it's in slow motion, and they barely catch the train, and then you cut over to Bill Murray, who didn't quite make it, and he's running, and his hat's flying <laughs> off, things are coming out of his suitcase, he doesn't make that train, and he's stuck in India for wherever he is, and that's, that, that slow motion scene, I had tears in my eyes because of the way it was shot and the way Bill Murray, of course, handled it. That's awesome. I mean, yeah. you bring up the Reservoir Dogs one, and Sinead, it seems like a lot of times now because of that shot it, it, that we see, like, like every time there's a superhero team and they're together for the first time, or like some badass action stars, like they always have to do a slow motion walk. Yeah. The Avengers uh, spin. Yeah. And the first Avengers when they're all like gearing mm -hmm. up in their separate ways to fight this alien presence. That's another one that I think will harken back to Reservoir Dogs in some small way. Do you have any favorite slow-mo scenes in movies? 
Well, actually, going off of that, groups walking down hallways. Uh, Kill Bill, there's <laughs> yeah. a slow mo mm-hmm. of them walking down the hallway, and then also even like in Bridesmaids after she gets kicked off the airplane, and their trip is cut short to Vegas. The whole crew of them are walking out of the airport, and it's totally slow mo, and there's music playing in the background, and yeah. it's great. Um, but I was gonna say Inception um, with Paris because I think that one that was the first one that comes to my mind, and I think that was. One of the best uses of slow-mo I've ever seen. You know what's another good one? Zombieland. In the credits, in the opening, where they're the, like the zombies are getting, they're running, and the, the zombies are doing their zombie thing, and it's two Metallicas whom the bell tolls playing yes. in the background. It's very slow motion in the credits. Very, it was very, uh, it was well done. And then again in uh, Deadpool. Uh, the mm-hmm. opening of Deadpool with the slow motion yes. and the and the song playing him, and, like, and all the credits the and and you know. Sexiest man alive poster goes yeah. by. Yeah. So that's another Speaking good one. Speaking of Metallica, great use of slow motion in their video, Enter Sandman. But the best yeah. use of slow motion in a music video, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Under the Bridge, Downtown. Oh, yeah. You know, it's just like running yeah. shirtless down the street. It's a weird video, but it's really good. All right, what's our next question? <laughs> All right, Francisco writes, Hey there, Collider crew. I was just thinking about Spider-Man and his future in the MCU. So, since Tom Holland is super young, would it be possible for there to be two Spider-Man trilogies in the MCU? The first one focusing on his high school years, while the second would be his college years and would introduce characters like the Osbournes and Gwen Stacy. However, since they did Gwen's death in the la- in the last Spidey film, would Marvel introduce her character again and then kill her in the second trilogy, as in that time... Several years will have passed since The Amazing Spider-Man 2, or would they consider that story to be too dark and not be consistent with the tone of the MC, that the MCU has presented us? Lighthearted, a lot of jokes, etc. Thus selecting Mary Jane has the definitive love interest for Peter Parker in this universe. Thank you and keep up the good work. I love this question. Uh, I'm a big fan of the comic run uh, that mm-hmm. where we lost Gwen Stacy. It's a very classic run. Um, and they did it, yeah, they did it in Amazing Spider-Man 2, and eh, it kind of, it didn't land with me, because by the time it happened... <laughs> she didn't land either. She ah! did, <laughs> hey, but I've been all, here all weekend, by the way, folks. <laughs> um, tip your waitress. Uh, the way they did it, by the time it happened in Amazing Spider-Man 2, I was already over that movie. Mm-hmm. I was like, I was just berated with too many villains, too many things, too many, too many, too much nonsense. I want to see the MCU do this. This is the definitive story of Peter Parker. It is almost as, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? It's as important to Peter Parker's arc as losing Uncle Ben. So I think that Marvel, if it's in Marvel's hands with their stories, with their producers, with the shared universe, with uh, the director, see how John Watts does on this next Spider-Man, I think that that can be a powerful, powerful moment and i think they should really look into it and and i bet they're already talking about it oh i mean all indications are that they're going to want to make as many spider-man movies as possible with tom holland and if his debut in civil war is any indication then they want him to stay this age for as long as he possibly can he does seem to have a young face so i think they're going to be able to milk a lot of either high school or college year era films out of him if they want to go down that route i do agree that i think mary jane should be the love interest for now you can introduce gwen stacy later and don't even worry about amazing spider-man amazing spider-man too yeah. I happen to really like Amazing Spider-Man. I didn't hate Amazing Spider-Man 2 like a lot of other people did. But you don't need to worry about anything that happened in those movies anymore. As far as the tone, Marvel trying to be lighter and maybe a too light for a Gwen Stacy death, I don't think that's going to be the case going forward because Marvel is about to get a little bit darker. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of jokes in the Infinity War films. But you're also going to have some death. You're yeah. going to have to kill some people. You can't just do the same thing. Even what you did in Age of Ultron right. with, uh, oh, is, is Hawkeye going to die? We talked about this on Movie Talk on Friday. Hawkeye, start getting that will together. You're not making it out of Infinity War. I can't see that scenario happening for a few of some of the beloved Marvel heroes in that universe. So you're going to have to have a Spider-Man be one of the key players moving forward after Infinity War. Yep. Even though his movie's technically with Sony and a Marvel collaboration. I wouldn't hate seeing a Spider-Gwen storyline. Because that was hugely popular yeah. when that comic was released not too long ago. So if you can spin off, no pun intended, a Spider-Gwen franchise from the introduction of Gwen Stacy, maybe a different route to take that. Sinead, do you love Spider-Man as much as Mark Riley and I clearly do? I do. And um, for someone who wasn't a huge fan of uh, The Amazing Spider-Man, <clears throat> um, 
I really liked Emma Stone, but we talked about this. I could not stand that scene. And oh, yeah, we did talk. That's right. Could not stand that scene, and I could not stand that movie. I really didn't like it. And I'm right there with you that by the time that death happened, to me, I was so over the movie that I... I felt like I should have been sadder and I just did not care. Yeah. I would love to see Gwen Stacy again and I would love to see her get the right amount of respect that I think her character deserves. Um, but I am also excited to see uh, Zendaya's role as well and th this kind of take on it. So I don't, I'm not like dying for Gwen Stacy right away, but I will love to see that eventually yeah. again. Yeah, I'm excited for Zendaya's take uh, on uh, on Mary Jane. Yeah. I think that's going to be interesting. I think this everything I've seen from this movie so far, we got to see a cool sneak peek in in a uh, hallway at Comic Con. It just it, they're really going the right direction with this, mm -hmm. though it's early. We'll see. All yeah. right, what's our next question? Um, Asif, I think it's Asif writes, dear Clyder Kroof, Kroof, <laughs> dear. <laughs> Oh, boy. Oh, dear God. Um, dear Collider Kroof, Crew, Kroof. how, how y'all doing? Gr writing's here from the UK. My question, what is your favorite scene in a movie where both the scene and the music played over it stand out and encapsulates that moment in the movie perfectly? My favorite moment where this happens is in the closing scene to Heat, 1995, where after a lengthy cat and mouse chase, Al Pacino's detective Vincent Hanna having tracked Robert De Niro's thief Neil McCauley to an airport field. Man has said he always had this ending in mind and the rest of of the movie was written around getting to this ending. But also note the effective use of Moby's track, God Moving Over the Face Over the Waters, which slowly starts coming into play when Pacino first walks up to De Niro after having shot him. That's a great example, God. Asif. And I'm gonna go with a couple, you know, songs that I think are known in pop culture, but they were used to not a condescending degree or not to sugarcoat anything that's happening, but they really accentuate the action on screen. One of which is a just a tremendous song that is a little melancholy, but also very uplifting when I hear it is imagined by John Lennon. And when that's played over the killing fields, it just, oh, man, it gets Ooh. all sorts of emotion Ooh. coming out of you. There's also a lot of times in war movies when they will use pop music to, you know, kind of act as a foil for the action that's happening, whether you want to talk about platoon or you want to talk about one of my favorite examples is Good Morning Vietnam, when they're showing all the horrors that happened in Vietnam and they're playing Louis Armstrong version of what a wonderful world over yeah. it oh man will that invoke a lot of tears in you also the end the door song the end in apocalypse now is a good use and then on a lighter note i will say the sister christian usage from the the night ranger song in boogie nights which is a movie i've not seen fully but i have seen that scene a number of times and it just seems to work so well in the movie i need to check out the rest of boogie nights i'll get to it Riley, what do you got? Well, what I got right now is we're going to turn off uh, the cameras right now and go watch Boogie Nights <laughs> because that is a brilliant film. I my hear God, good things. Oh. I hear good things. All right, so I'm going to go with, of course, my favorite composer all time, John Williams, with one of my favorite movies yeah. all time, The Empire Strikes Back. And this is one of the most spine-chilling, perfect moments ever. In a, probably my favorite moment. This is a great question. Use of music, story, character, shooting, everything. And that's when Luke's hanging in the Wampa Pit, okay, in the cave on Hoth, and he sees his lightsaber just out of reach. And he still, he hasn't trained with Obi-Wan yet, but that force music swells, and he reaches out. I mean, I'm just talking about it. I'm, I'm getting chills. That is such a perfect moment. It's the force theme, the most beautiful theme in history by John Williams. And you can just tell it, this is a huge moment moment for Luke. He has to get that lightsaber to save his life. Because what if the Wampa killed Luke? I mean, that movie over. That's it. No more Jedi. <laughs> think, See ya. I think old George might have had to do a couple rewrites yeah. if uh, you had Luke dying that early But in the movie. It, it is such, it is one of the most amazing moments where music and acting and, and effects and everything kind of come into play. And this is another, you guys, you're all fans of Jeremy Johns. Tweet at Jeremy Johns right now <laughs> and tell him that Riley was telling you to say, that scene in the Wampa Cave with Luke in Empire Strikes Back. He'll know what I mean. He, me and him go He's back a and fan forth. Of it oh, as well. God. we talk about all that. This question was brought up somewhere in our time together, and we both looked at each other we're like, "Yeah." That I mean, one. look, look we, we saw John Williams at the Hollywood Bowl last night, and yeah, maybe I had a few Chardonnays, and you just get teary at several moments that oh, he boy. plays in all of his iconic movies. But my favorite moment in Star Wars that that is in concert with the music playing. There's so many great ones. There's literally not a bad one, but. 
if I had to go with one, the most iconic to me is the binary sunset. When oh, it's yeah. Luke looking out on the two setting suns of Tatooine, and he's thinking about his future and what that might hold. He has no idea the adventure he's about to embark on for the rest of his days. And you hear that music, and it swells with the London Symphony Orchestra. Just one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in, it, in or out of cinema. It's absolutely perfect. Which is a great compliment to the scene that uses a version of the same music in the Wampa Cave that kind of extends that story. The longing and then putting it into action when needed on life or death situation. Love it. Thank you guys for joining us here on Grown Men Gushing About Violin. Sinead, <laughs> what's our next question? Sam Dean writes, Hello, Collider, you guys are my daily addiction. You often mention how when certain actors like The Rock sign on to a movie, it gives it instant credibility. So my question is, which actors or actresses, after starring in too many bad and or giving too many bad performances, have you guys given up on or are almost ready to give up on? For me, I'm almost ready to give up on Johnny Depp. Thanks, and may the force be with you. Yeah, Johnny Depp came back into my good graces with um, uh, well, this Whitey Bulger movie. Black Can you Mass. please? Thank you, Black Mass. The so he's from way downtown. Yeah. So <laughs> good. Yeah. Nice. Because um, he, I was losing it with Johnny Depp, mm -hmm. and this is gonna pain me to say, but De Niro, De Niro needs to. Shame. He's uh, he's jumping into these comedies with, that aren't good, mm -hmm. and um, they're a little bit. They're they're taking away. The gloss, the prestige that I know my, my De Niro in Taxi Driver, my De Niro in Heat that we talked about in Godfather 2. I love De Niro. Even when he did, you know, Meet the Parents, I was like, when I saw the first trailer, I was like, oh, God. Wonderful movie. I love that movie so much. And now with the bad grandpa, and it's just, I'm like, well, and then that movie with Anne Hathaway. The intern. The intern, I'm like. I found dude. that somewhat charming when of I watched it on the did. airplane. Jesus. <laughs> Everybody should see that movie on an airplane. Yeah. It's, a, it's an airplane movie. It, it is. totally I, is. It sure. should have premiered in the air. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's you know? a good one. I think, I think we should uh, maybe turn into some uh, premieres on the airplane. <laughs> straight to airplane is what they're going to call it now instead of straight to VOD. Um, yeah, so uh, De, De Niro's kind of doing that for me, but we'll see with Hands of Stone what he can do. I know he's playing a, a, a boxing coach. So. Hands of Stone I want to check out. Then he also yeah. has The Irishman coming up where it's going to reteam him with Scorsese and Probably Pacino. a return to greatness there. I, I'll just put my money out there right now saying – He'll probably wipe the stink off a bad uh, grandpa with that. Well, not only that, but you also have to wipe the stink off with the movies that De Niro and Pacino did with, uh, you know, Righteous Killer, whatever that was. Like, like they were great in Heat, and then said we want to see another teaming of them in a movie worthy of their ability. Mm -hmm. I hope The Irishman is that because Pacino is another example where sometimes you just you know he's rolling out of bed and getting a paycheck, and he's still fun to watch. In times, I have enjoyed his work. Uh, more recently in the whatever the Hey Baby Doll movie was. He oh, was yeah. really good in that film, yeah. and I want to see him continue to do that. Somebody else that, you're right, it does kind of pain you to say, because I always root for people to come back and stay in in prominent roles. Nicolas Cage is a guy who I think has all the talent in the world. He is mm -hmm. an A-list actor. He is an Academy Award level guy, as he's proven in the past, but he did a lot of bad direct-to-video movies there for a while to get yeah. some paychecks. I think this Indianapolis movie he's in, though, Right, the you and I, the Metacritic. Yeah, we watched that. Yeah, that trailer on Friday. It's, it's got a lot amazing. of Nicolas Cage in that trailer. Got a lot of sharks in there. It's based on a true story. It's a war film. I think that could be a nice comeback pitch for him. Somebody else is Liam Neeson, who it's he was great in Taken, and then he does like 900 roles where he's this you know middle aged action star. I want to see him commit to those roles again, and I think he can do that. Plus, his voiceover in A Monster Calls mm. sounds terrific so yeah. far. So that's something I'd be up for. All right, what's up next? Tristan writes, Wagwan, Collider, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> this is your biggest Jamaican fan here, and I love the show. It's a part of my daily routine. In honor of the return of the great Sir Jonathan Campia, <laughs> what is your favorite sequel to a dead franchise? For example, The Force Awakens, 17 years later. Yeah, I mean, it, it's funny to say in retrospect now, but Star Wars was a dead franchise. Not that people didn't love it, the world and the galaxy over, but it just seemed like we were never going to get any more Star Wars movies. So when we got the news that Disney acquired Lucasfilm for a few pennies and that there were going to be more movies, it's like, oh my God, I felt like Jasmine when she was on the magic carpet of Aladdin. <laughs> it was a whole new world. Don't you dare close your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to think of another franchise that would have had that impact on me or like another uh, sequel to a franchise that we didn't think we were going to get. The one that I will say that I guess a lot of people weren't that high on and one for me I thought could have been a return to greatness for the franchise is Predators. Mm, because Predators yeah. 
with Adrian Brody, it took us to an entirely different planet. And we were on there and it had like a, you know, most dangerous game, hard target feel to it where they, they were just a bunch of convicts used as bait for the predators to go hunt. It was like some rich guy had this huge planet all to himself. And he just wanted to see them run against predators. And I loved what they did with it. It totally got the stink of Predator 2 and the Aliens versus Predators mishaps off my chest. And now I just got to enjoy this adventure. Now, whatever Shane Black wants to do with Predator, I'm totally cool with going forward. But that was one that I thought showed a lot of promise to a franchise that we might have thought was getting a little rotten there. What yeah. do you got? Well, I immediately thought of Mad Max Fury Road. I mean, that, that came mm-hmm. out and uh, reinvented the franchise a lot people loved it It was nominated for a best picture um you know and that stands out to me the one that really did it for me though was creed creed was yes. a great i mean it kind of reinvigorated the franchise it is a it it's rocky it's a rocky story in there but it does focus on creed obviously which i loved love love that story so much and obviously it was a return to greatness for rocky balboa sylvester salone who got an oscar nomination that thing is back now and kicking and i can't wait for a creed sequel to see where this story goes because i love the idea of rocky balboa taking on the boxing manager and and seeing his journey there he no longer has adrian this is his life Life now, and I like that we are now we've moved into the new generation, and it's thanks to Creed. You know, it's a film that we never thought we'd see. And Sinead, I want to get your take on this too. Is when they announced, uh, I don't, I mean, you had heard rumors from time to time about these two possibly reteaming, but the fact that we're getting another Bad Boys movie, right? However many years later, when I think Martin Lawrence can still deliver, and I know Will Smith can, I'm excited about that movie. Are you pumped for Bad Boys Three? Uh, yeah, I, I. I mean, look at all, everything that we're rebooting and remaking. So I don't think that that movie doesn't deserve a reboot or a remake. But I mean, it's always tough. You know, I was talking to my little brother about this over the weekend. And I was like, I don't know. I feel like I'm getting over it slowly, but surely I'm starting to be like, all right, I want some original content. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Bad Boys actually makes me excited. Um, also, I heard that. Um, the studio that did Ace Ventura, which I want to say is, who is that? Warner Brothers? Fox? Uh, I thought it was Fox? New Line, New Line? actually. Yeah, yeah, New Line, which is, is yeah, Line? Warner um, Brothers. So, yeah. um, they sold a bunch of their like rights and stuff like that uh, from the early 90s and early 2000s, but they kept the rights to Ace Ventura. Mm. Which makes, oh, that makes me nervous. Yeah, it makes me extremely nervous. Um, but I, I know that they sold a bunch of their rights, movie rights, into the ether for other people to snag. But they made a special note of keeping the rights to Ace, um, Ace Ventura. So I don't know. That makes me really scared. But it almost makes me feel like it's not going to be long before we hear about a reboot. I think if you could Probably keep right. the rights to Ace Ventura, it's a smart move on the Saturday morning cartoon front. If you want to make a kid yeah. showing an animated show based on that character, I... Even though I'm wearing this shirt, I can't imagine seeing Ace Ventura again, with, whether it's Jim Carrey playing an older Ace Ventura or, I mean, I, I never want to count Jim Carrey out, and that movie had such an incredible impact on me growing it's incredible. up. incredible. That movie is just But I don't amazing. know that we can get Ace Ventura and have it be mm-hmm. the same way it felt in 94. I mean, I, I didn't even like When Nature Calls that much. No. You know, it just, it almost feels like a perfect time capsule of somebody reaching their prime as a movie star so sudden and so fast mm-hmm. and so hilariously so. God, I think they're going to do it. I think, oh, I, you know my what? God. My first <laughs> thought was animated. I was like, oh, animated. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I was really thinking about it and I was like, dude, it's 2016. Like, we're gonna get another reboot live action of this movie. It's going to happen. Well, I think they'll try to do the, uh, a sequel with yeah. Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey, uh, maybe going back a, a couple questions to like, he hasn't been around that much. Right. Uh, you know, I'm waiting to see. Right. I can't remember what he's got next. And it scares me to think he might come back for a 20 years later Ace mm-hmm. Ventura, where it's like Ace is doing whatever he's doing. And then we, we pick, oh, God. Jeez. You guys, I saw him at the club the other night. <laughs> you saw oh, Jim Carrey? At the club, huh? Really? <laughs> yeah, I saw Jim Carrey at the club. Um, what club? Uh, I don't want to say. Were you partying? Yeah. Were you like dancing? In West, no, in West, TGI Fridays? in West Hollywood on oh. Sunset Boulevard really? near the uh, near Whiskey. Whiskey. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, he looked like he shouldn't have been at the club at 1 o'clock in the morning. Oh, boy. Okay. There it okay. is. Well, yeah. that's our gym. I met him a few times. I uh, got to hang out with him at the comedy store one time, and it was one of the highlights of my life. I love that man to death. He's a gem. Mm -hmm. (laughs) All right, what's our next question? All right, Derek writes, what movie from your childhood that was perhaps not seen by a lot of people would like to see get remade or updated? I I thought I was repeating myself. Uh, For me, it would be (laughs) movies like Toy Soldiers, Band of the Hand, Fortress, and Arena. 
Well, I'm going to go easy and use my answer from yesterday on, uh, or sorry, uh, when was I on Movie Talk? Not Dude, yesterday. you drank way too much I, of John Williams. Geez, oh my God, there was so much wine flowing. <laughs> Um, no, but we had a great question where I thought about it. Uh, bed knobs and broomsticks. Explain Have you, your answer, sir. Bed knobs and broomsticks is a Disney movie that I grew up with. Angela Lansbury was in it. She played a witch. It was during World War II. And uh, she takes, she puts a magic bed knob on the bed, and they get on the bed, and they go through all these adventures with, like, cartoon characters. And, and they, you know, there's a war with, uh, she puts all the... Uh, the, the armor to life and they take on the Nazis. It's really, really fun. The effects don't hold up, obviously, but it's one of those movies that I think could really work as a remake. And if, if I didn't know or see or any of this Pete's Dragon stuff, I would have said the same thing about Pete's Dragon. I think that was ripe for a remake and they did it. So along those lines, I think Disney could really get somewhere with the bed knobs and broomstick um, remake. It's an interesting. All right, Sinead, uh, that's Riley's pitch for a remake <laughs> is Angela Lansbury, who's still alive, by the way. She's still around. And still she can pass on her good witch tendencies. So she's like a good witch. She was a good witch. She's a good witch. Yeah, she was a great witch. She, it seems like she was a great witch. She's a Nazi fighting witch. Yeah. And she uses armor that she made out of bedpans and broomsticks. Interesting. Bed sure. Pans. Did I say bed bedpans? Bedpans. <laughs> well, bedpans. That's it. You pee into it. You throw it in a Nazi's face. That's the log line. Yeah. I am gonna pitch you three movies that I think you're gonna want to make over bedpans and bingo. Bed knobs okay. and. <laughs> Spawn. <laughs> Spawn. Spawn is a comic book yep. franchise, so you know there's right going to be dollars it. in there. It's a, it's the classic image comic. Todd McFarlane still passionate about the property. It's about a dude goes to hell, goes through a lot of changes, kind of like an anti-hero situation. They made a movie version of it. It was terrible in the 90s. Bring back Spawn. Bring back War Games. Because War Games was a great time capsule film. It's a lot like that movie with Sandra Bullock, The Net, where it was fun for its day, but it's just so dated. But if we update War Games and we have hackers as they exist today, mm -hmm. hacking into government agencies, doing stuff they shouldn't do, setting off nuclear bombs, could be really enticing. And the one that we need to remake, guys, if you've never heard of this movie. Anybody else heard of uh, Robot Jocks? No. no. Never heard of robot jocks? No. It was a bunch of robots. They'd get into an arena and fight each other. And the special effects are so terrible. It was in the early 90s. Definitely check it out. It's called Robot Jocks, J-O-X. Robot Jocks. We should remake it. And it'd be like Pacific Grim, except like as a sport, like a UFC sport. It's like BattleBots meets Transformers Robot Jocks. I Which movie do you want to see? Out of those four? I haven't heard of any four of those movies. Can I pitch one? Yeah. Um, there's a movie from the 90s, I want to say, um, Roald Dahl, uh, The Witches. Yeah, Angelica Houston. Yeah, uh, not a lot of people have seen that that's movie. That's right. Yeah, that's a good it one. It was so good. And they they had like um, like uh, real life, you know, makeup. To yeah, make yeah, the practical effects. company did all that yes, stuff. That's yes. right. And um, I feel like I, it's really surprised me that we haven't seen a reboot of that movie yet. Maybe because it's Roald Dahl and once they touch him, they don't touch him again. Which well, is fine. kids, this is what happens in Hollywood. Is that you get two aspiring writers. They come into a pitch meeting with a high level executive. We throw our best ideas at her. And then she's like, hey, why don't you guys go write a witch movie instead? Uh -huh. <laughs> so now we got to go to a witch movie. How yeah. about I got uh, three words for you. Mac and me. Yeah, shot for shot remake of Mac and Me, just like they did with Psycho, shot for shot, and then I'm going to flip it. Mac and Me, shot for shot remake in black and white. Let's just do it. And then at the end of Mac and Me, uh, shot for shot remake, we have a uh, deleted scene, or like a post credit scene with Harry and the Hendersons, and we have a shared universe, Harry and the Hendersons, Mac and Me. It leads to a huge fight in 2025. Love that idea. Let's do it. Hollywood? Bunch of ideas here. Call us. We have a lot of fun here on Mailbag, but it's rare that we just print a billion dollars with what we just did. <laughs> all right. What's our next question? <laughs> Brett writes, hi, all. Just watched The Conjuring 2, and I thought it was a major step down from the first film. It's no Mac and me. In fact, <laughs> in fact I hated it. There were way Whoa. too many cheap jump scares, too much CGI, a horrible script, and the overall look and feel of the film was way too slick. It just felt very Hollywood and generic. I feel like one obvious cause of the drop in quality with The Conjuring 2 could have been too large of a budget. The first film had half the budget of the second, $20 million as opposed to $40 million, and yielded a much better end product. Do some genres function better on smaller budgets? Also, are you now even more worried about how much of a garbage pile Aquaman might be? 
All right. Love you. Love you, too, Brett. Thank you for not holding back. I did not share your <laughs> sentiments necessarily about The Conjuring 2. I enjoyed that horror movie, though. I will agree with you that I think it was a little over-reliant on some effects, some jump scares, whereas the first one was more imaginative with how it approached scaring you. I don't pin all that on James Wan, though. I think that we simply had a story in The Conjuring 2 that wasn't quite as engaging and gripping and, to be honest, scary as the first one was. I think The Conjuring 2 lacked some intrinsic scares in the actual plot line, so they threw in this, albeit really scary-looking nun that still haunts me to this day. You just kind of threw in there, and now maybe we get a sprint out, spin out franchise with her if you were to believe all these reports. So I do agree with you to some level, Brett and Riley. I want your take on this too, where if you are blessed with too big of a budget, it can make a film sometimes lazy. And while I'm not necessarily going to say that The Conjuring 2 is guilty of that, that a lot of times you get a lot of money and you can have whatever vision you want when we read time and time again that there's stories of filmmakers starting on their career when they didn't have everything at their means and they had to work around some mishaps, whether it was on set with something that wouldn't work right, like Bruce the Shark and Jaws, and they couldn't show the shark as much as they wanted to initially, or it's somebody like George Lucas who's creating Star Wars and doesn't have the huge effects budget that he would later have with Industrial Light and Magic for Empire and Return of the Jedi. So sometimes being handcuffed financially actually ends up with a more creative product. I do agree with that sentiment. What's your take? Yeah, I I, I agree with that as well, and uh, just with all due respect, I I enjoyed the hell out of The Conjuring 2. and uh, What's thought, that nun's name? Like, the, uh, 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 Ravitz? Be the Sheep? No. Uh, that was the first one. Yeah. Uh, I want to say it starts with a V. I can't remember. Um, whatever. I, I really enjoyed The Conjuring 2, and with that being said, I think that it can go both ways. I think more money in a sequel can help the movie. Uh, as well as hinder it because it might be over-reliant on special effects, too much CGI, using that as a uh, means to tell a story rather than a tool and relying on it. I think the prequels did that. I, I honestly think you know they had a lot of money behind it, a lot of CGI. I think it was Lucas relying on that technology to tell a story rather than story. Mm -hmm. and, and that is just, you know, I've now come to respect the prequels and see a lot of good in them, but... Um, you, you had to try really hard. I had to try really hard. Now I, I, I actually see a lot of good in them, and I, know, I, I, I changed I, my... I, I do find redeeming values in each one of the prequels, sure. but they just don't measure up to what we had before. Exactly. So, uh, you know, I, I think that it, it's all dependent on who the director is, who the studio is behind it, and the script. And I, I see it over and over on the show. It always starts with the script. So if you have a fantastic script from fantastic writers with a fantastic director or somebody that knows how to use effects to their advantage or use a budget then you put the budget to good use in certain ways that could be not even seen it could be just in the costume design or uh, the sound effects or what, what have you so but then there are movies out there that i would think uh, immediately think of uh, independence day resurrection where they had a big budget and they just Oh, boy, they put that out there, didn't they? Did you just uh, confuse Independence Day Resurgence with the Mechanic Resurrection? With the Mechanic Resurrection? Yeah. Oh, Resurgence? Yeah. Independence no, was Day was the one that resurged. Resurgence. The Mechanic is the one that Did I say Resurrection? Yeah. I probably did. You didn't. can't make these mistakes I, I just on a high-quality program with I a can't. snazzy dresser like me. I, uh, this is very true. Mm. This is very true. I apologize. Either way, Resurgence, <laughs> resur re Resurrection, whatever was, the hell it was. It's terrible in any language. Just, just awful. So there, you know, that's my answer. The uh, the nun's name was Valak. There it is. Sister Valak. Rosemary Valak was her name. Um, Sinead, do you have faith? I have faith in Aquaman going for us. I think James Wan is such a creative storyteller. I like his vision, and I think hopefully by the time Doctor Strange comes out with another horror to comic book. Uh, director and Scott Derrickson. I think that gives us a little more hope for what James Wan can do with Aquaman. Uh, yeah. Did you see Conjuring 2? Did it scare you? I think uh, not as good as the first one. Um, I mean, I've never been a huge Conjuring person anyways. I don't I don't love horror movies. They but, scare you? Uh, yeah, and I just can't get like into them. You know, it's very rare that I get into a horror movie. But I will say that I actually do think that Horror movies do benefit from smaller budgets. If I think of like The Visit, It Follows, some of my favorite ones, yeah. The First Conjuring, um, some of the ones that I do actually enjoy are the ones that had zero money to work with, um, especially It Follows. I mean, like that movie was creepy as hell. Oh, I love that movie. Made that yeah. movie with like 12 or $13, I think. Yeah. Um, but uh, Aquaman, no. I What we've seen of Aquaman so far, I like. Mm -hmm. I interviewed James Wan um, at, uh, at uh, WonderCon 
before The Conjuring, mm-hmm. but we talked a little bit about Aquaman, and he is so passionate and so excited to bring this character to life. And one of his one of his things that he really pushed was that um, he's he's kind of the first one to really do it, and I feel mm-hmm. like that opens up so much more excitement because there's nothing you ha- you feel like you have to go off of, and I feel like that is what we need with superhero films nowadays. The new ones is just to imagine a character um, that hasn't been imagined before. And especially since fans, and we're all guilty of it, have a really hard time accepting new iterations of characters that we love, namely the Joker and Suicide Squad, who mm-hmm. I happen to really enjoy, and it still blows my mind that everyone hates Jared Leto as the Joker, or a lot of people do, because I'm like, dude, it's a new iteration of something we haven't seen before, like we yeah. should appreciate that. That gives me excitement for Aquaman because guess what? Nobody knows what Aquaman is is like except for in the comics. So I'm excited and I think that he's going to do a great job. In my opinion, they already did the hardest job possible with Aquaman to get me excited about it. Show us right. Aquaman and he's no longer a punchline. Now he's Mark Riley in a nice Halloween costume. <laughs> All right. What's our last question of today's mailbag? David writes, hey, Clyder, being one of the apparent few who liked BBS, F me, right? While also acknowledging <laughs> <laughs> also acknowledging its flaws. I'm disappointed that when the positives of the film are discussed, we only hear about Batman and Wonder Woman. I've been a Superman guy my entire life, and I'm down with Henry Cavill's portrayal so far. But it seems many fans and critics aren't. I'm also a little peeved that the marketers built up the hashtag who will win campaign only to have a completely one-sided fight. Of course, I knew WB would have Batman win, but didn't Superman deserve a little more respect? Also, how do you see him evolving upon his return in Justice League? Thanks to you all for doing such an amazing job. Well, David, you're asking the right person right now, <laughs> even though I'm wearing a Batman hat. <laughs> right, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized that. I almost went with my Superman hat today, but uh, couldn't find there it. There is Superman apparel somewhere on Mark Rowley's body. Trust me. There is. There is. I could, well, uh, <laughs> that's for a show for another time. Uh Yeah, Superman has not been given a lot of respect, and that has everything to do with Warner Brothers. I'm sorry, but you blew it. I don't like that you follow up a great movie with Man of Steel. I did love it. I did. I really like the mythology. I'm on record. The mythology was great. It does have flaws. But I was so excited to see them address it, move forward, expand on the mythology, expand, get a little deeper in Clark Kent, Henry Cavill's Superman, Kal-El. He's... He's a great Superman. He's one of the best. I really enjoy him. He's much better than Brandon Routh. I do like I did like Brandon Routh in Superman Returns, but Henry Cavill has got it going on. I dig him. But then he was shoved aside in honor of Batman to get box office dollars. That's what I thought. They said, you know what? No Man of Steel sequel. We're getting Batman v Superman. Let's throw Batman into it, get some more box office dollars. Uh, but I'm also with you on this as well, David. I really enjoyed uh, Batman v Superman. I do acknowledge its flaws. But I had a hell of a time. But Superman's story, they didn't focus on it. He was an afterthought. And Mm -hmm. it was so troubling to me. And even as Zack Snyder, I have a lot of respect for the guy. He's he's great at what he does. He has great visuals. I think he needs to focus more on story sometimes. And really, I don't think he gets Superman. He said some comments at one point about Superman being able to hear certain things out in the world and why doesn't he help everyone and he only picks and chooses it was just a weird way to to describe superman i don't i don't think of him that way so moving forward i think the fans have been very vocal about the lack of superman development in batman v superman so for justice league i really hope that they focus more on him because you have a great storyline that they're jumping off of in the death of superman and sorry no spoiler alert you you should know this by now and (laughs) Death of Superman, Justice League, we know we've seen teases of his black suit that Henry Cavill shared on Instagram, so we're going to get that storyline. We're going to see, hopefully, a different Superman coming back who's been through death and back and what it's doing to him. And I, I, I think they just need to focus more on that, and I hope they do that. I will start at the end of David's question, and I want to start on a positive note here because I'm very excited to see where they take the war of Superman coming back into the forefront with the black costume. I think that's going to be awesome. And I'm going to attempt something that I've never, ever done before. 
use a sports metaphor. So I think that the reason why Superman <laughs> didn't get the critical praise that Wonder Woman and Batman did is that he wasn't set up for success in this movie. If you look at the composition of last year's Golden State Warriors, I think that Batman was like Steph Curry and Clay Thompson was like Wonder Woman. They were given the keys to succeed yeah. in that game plan mm -hmm. in the same way that Batman v Superman let Gal Gadot and they let Ben Affleck shine as their characters. And I think that Superman was relegated to like a Harrison Barnes role where it's like, yeah, he's going to be in there. And Riley, my question to you yeah. is, do you think that I think we can agree that DC might have hit the panic button a little bit mm -hmm. by shoehorning Batman into a Superman sequel and then calling it Batman v Superman and setting up the Justice League. Yeah. And I'm not all that upset uh, how soon we're getting Justice League movies. Yeah. But do you think that it would have served their universe better in the long run if they had done a proper sequel to Superman? Yeah. And then after that, you can introduce Batman and then you can have the Dawn of Justice setting up and getting the Justice League because now Superman feels a little shortchanged. Yes. But I also acknowledge it is going to be pretty cool to see him come back. You mean Man of Steel, then Man of Steel 2, and then maybe a Batman v Superman? I think so, yeah. I think yeah. If, if they weren't feeling the heat both from, from what Marvel was doing with their incredible team-up universe mm -hmm. and from the fans as well, that were like, yeah, Man of Steel was a little, uh, it, was, it was a little bleak. It just, you know, it was a little, it was too serious in tone or whatever problems people had with Man of Steel. And I had those issues the first time I saw it. I watched it again recently for our, uh, you know, segment here on Collider, and I actually thought it was much better yeah. than I remember it being. Do you think that they should have gone with the route of taking their time and developing Superman first before throwing all these other characters in there? Well, yeah, and at least just give me a Man of Steel sequel because what we had with DC was we were coming off of the great run with Nolan's Batman trilogy. Mm -hmm. And so Batman was so in the public. He was in the conversation always, and you're inevitably going to compare it when Ben Affleck was cast. It was like, well, what about Nolan? There was rumors that Nolan's Batman... Christian Bale is going to show up at the as a tag at the end of Man of Steel. That, I remember that rumor. So what you could have done is do another Man of Steel movie, Man of Steel 2, and get behind, get everybody in love with Superman again. Then you care about Superman, and all of a sudden the next movie, it's Batman, and you reintroduce him. Now you have Superman that everybody loves, and then you do a new version of Batman, and you put him in Batman v Superman. Sure, do it then, and introduce Wonder Woman a little bit. I had no problem introducing Wonder Woman in Batman v Superman, and even Batman. Batman sh really shined in Batman v Superman. I'm not saying he didn't. I just, you know, and I'm totally biased. I love Superman so much, so I wanted more. So to answer your question, yes, I think a Man of Steel 2 would have been great to set up more character with Superman, and maybe put some Easter eggs in there, maybe a cameo of Batman in there or a cameo of Diana Prince, and then go into Batman v Superman. I think in the long run, it would have made everyone care more about the characters, and we'd even be even more excited for Justice League. But that's my two cents. Well, your two cents can be notarized if Sinead DeVry signs off on it. Is that your thoughts as well, Sinead, or do you think it was the right move to just go ahead and give us Batman v Superman, focus on Batman and Wonder Woman, or let them have the high moments of that movie so we can get Justice League quicker? Well, I think, like you said, they hit the panic button because coming off of Nolan's Batman, they were like, okay, we know this works. We know that people love Batman, and mm -hmm. Man of Steel didn't get crazy good reviews although it was mixed but it wasn't it wasn't insane people weren't mm -hmm. like dying over it the way that we were dying over Marvel movies at that time so they were like all right well let's just put Batman in there and like let's you know put some life into this in in this franchise and people are gonna get excited and Batman v Superman I mean it sounds cool remember how excited we were yes for when we were I remember we were on AMC and we were talking about the next year across the board everyone was looking forward to BVS so much more than Civil War it was like mm -hmm. hands yeah. down the thing that we were all excited for and they knew that that sounds incredible Batman v Superman sounds amazing yeah. but yeah they really effed up because that's that's where that's where they put all of their thoughts and even making a BVS movie with that in mind was their biggest problem because they wanted to introduce Batman but they didn't just introduce him they let him take over the whole thing I mean it was like Batman and a little bit of Superman is what it should have been called and I like Batman v Superman a lot than more than a lot of other people yeah, did me too. but I also think that Superman deserved a hell of a lot more in that movie and that was my biggest issue with the whole movie movie was that they wrote it as if they weren't thinking about him and it made me sad because 
I, I went, went into BVS thinking like this is the first thing we're seeing since Man of Steel. So we're going to get a lot of Superman. And it was the exact opposite. Yeah. Of that. yeah. I mean, look, exactly. I'm not a huge Superman guy, though. I will say hearing J Dubs play the orchestra version of the original Superman theme is pretty damn Oof. spectacular. Yep. But I, you know, I, I thought that they were rushing it a little bit when they made that announcement that Batman was going to be fighting him and Batman v Superman. Having said all that, look. I'm very excited for the future of the DC Universe. I mm -hmm. really am. I did not love Batman v Superman. I did not love Suicide Squad. For some reason, I still have a lot of faith in what this universe is going to provide us sooner rather than later. I think Wonder Woman is going to be great. I think the standalone Batman is going to be great. I think Aquaman and the Flash are going to be awesome. And I think Justice League is going to kick ass. Maybe I'm setting myself up for disappointment again, but I don't care because that's part of the fun of being a movie fan so we can get excited and let our emotions take over once we get in the movie theater. Thank you guys for joining us here on Collider Mailbag, the spectacular Sunday edition wherever you guys are watching at whatever time you're watching if it's in the morning where you are or it's 1 p.m or 1 a.m in the club in west hollywood with ace ventura <laughs> and Sinead defreeze i want to thank everybody both behind the camera getting up early on a sunday to hang out with us as well as the panel up here with me mr mark riley where can everybody find you and your superman accoutrement <laughs> you can find me at riley around on twitter and instagram this tuesday collider nightmares and go ahead check out the Schmodown match that happened this past Friday, me against Elliot Dewberry. How'd I fare? I don't know. You're going to have to find out. No spoilers here. Stone faced Riley, yeah. Mission Aid to Freeze. When you are not out clubbing in certain areas of West Hollywood, where can the world at large find you on a social media basis? I'm online at Sinead to Freeze and at that's so .com. on Mondays here hosting Glider TV Talk, even though um, tomorrow is Labor Day. So we will not be here tomorrow. We will be here on Tuesday. And then on Fridays, hosting Movie Talk and hosting Mailbag over the weekends. It's Labor Day. I forgot. I don't have to be here tomorrow. I know. I'm so excited. Here anyway. uh, my name is Mark Ellis, and I am at Mark Ellis Live on Twitter. You guys can get tickets to upcoming stand-up comedy shows in your area, markelloslive.com. That means you, New Jersey, and that means you, New York. Get ready. Early October. Maybe a Comic-Con thing? I don't know. I just I hear things. See you guys Tuesday. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.